Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for tuning in to Red Eyes Radio. This is Henry Ken, the website is redeyescreations.com where you can go to find more radio, TV programs, news, commentaries, videos, films and much more on all kinds of subjects that we find interesting and important. If you're new to the program, take a look in our archives. Lots of controversial, exciting and hopefully perspective broadening material that will make you think and question. That's what it's all about. Mark Weber, historian, author, lecturer and current affairs analyst, is director of the Institute for Historical Review, an independent public interest educational center and publisher based in Southern California. Mark is a specialist of modern 20th century European and American history and is the author of many articles, reviews and essays dealing with historical, political and social issues. And today Mark is with us to discuss U.S. foreign policy, the world wars, the Israeli-Palestine conflict and conspiracies. He emphasizes the danger in a one-sided view of history. We'll talk about how there is a great chasm between what people know and the official story when it comes to history, politics and the media. Welcome to Red Eyes Radio. Mark Weber, first of all, thank you for coming on the program. We really Appreciate it. Uh, how are you today, Mark? Thank you very much for having me on. I'm fine, and I'm pleased to be on with you. Absolutely. You are, of course, the director of the Institute for Historical Review, a very, very important topic. IHR.org is is the website. And, and uh, to look at history again a, a second time, a, a third time, a fourth time, etc., to go over the details and make sure that we got it right is an extremely important thing to be able to do. Uh, as we know, Mark, the world has been shaped by the history uh, that have been written by the victors of, of many of the wars that unfortunately have been fought throughout human history. Um, so the freedom to be able to review history is an extremely important thing to be able to do uh, in order to balance the debate uh, that we have in our world. Uh, and it's always presented as a very black and white issue. So with that in mind, you know, I read on your website um, about the IR, IRH that you strive towards, uh, in the words of Harry Elmer Barnes to bring history uh, into accord with the facts. And obviously, again, that's a very, very important part. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about the IRH and, and how it and when it got started. You've been going since 78, so you've been doing this for quite a long time now. Right. I, I myself uh, moved to Southern California at the beginning of 1991, and I've been working here since then. I've been the director of the Institute for Historical Review since 1995, but I've been associated with for much of my adult life. I've been uh, contributing to the IHR, which was uh, founded in 1978-79, so we've been around for quite a while. And there's been a lot of changes over the years, um, in both you know internally and so forth, and even in, even in the, you might say the focus or the the uh, emphasis that we put put on issues. But what we want to do is is not merely correct the h- historical record in a in a kind of general way. That's a that's a theoretical thing, and it's it's a good thing. But but our, our main goal is to constantly relate um, what's going on in the world today to our our sense of history because an understanding of what's going on in the world and more importantly what to do about it to deal with problems in the future requires an understanding of of historical dynamics power how things happen how, how things came about because otherwise, if, if it's motivated merely by the concerns of the moment, there, there just isn't going to be any, any, any really solving of those problems. And I, I put a great deal of blame, I think, on political leaders, and educators, who in a sense know better, but uh, their, their worldview, their prejudices, and so forth, uh, inhibit, uh, really, um, uh, dealing with, with many of the problems that we see all around the, the world today. And anyway, we try very much to relate uh, the um, uh, history to, to problems that are happening right now. Of course, a big issue right now in the world is is the prospect of war with Iran. Yes. And Israeli leaders have been talking a great deal, very bluntly, very openly, that they will attack uh, Iran, uh, even with uh, possibly nuclear weapons, um, if Iran does not uh, cease to uh, carry on its what it says is, an, is a peaceful nuclear program. I mean, it's anybody's guess. Uh, and but the, but the point is this is this is a major international issue and looking at it requires 
a solid understanding of well, how did this happen? What 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 motivates Iran? What motivates Israel? What what are, what are the pro- and the United States in all of this? And without that historical background, without that historical understanding, uh, it's just, it's it's impossible to really deal with that in any kind of sober or intelligent way. I absolutely agree, and and this is maybe a subject we can go into a little bit more detail detail in here a little bit later, uh, because I want to ask you what you consider to be some of the most uh, well, problematic areas, if you will, then, of history as you see it, and also how far back we need to go, because on, on this program, Mark, we've taken the opportunity, if you will, to actually go back even into prehistory to understand the uh, human condition, if you will. But how far back do we need to go to uh, get a better, better grip on history? Well, okay, yeah, that's right. This this can go back very, very far. And over the over the years, as you may know from the broadcasts I do and from the material that's on our website, we deal with many... Uh, chapters of history, American Civil War or the uh, World War One, and so forth. But I, I think there are really two main historical issues that are really quite relevant in in our time. The first is the history background to the to the Middle East conflict. Uh, to, to Zionism, the founding state of Israel, the conflict between um, Israel and and the Arab countries, and so forth. That's that's one area that's very very important. The other is World War Two. World War II is very important because it's held up over and over as the great conflict from which we are supposed to draw lessons. When you hear people say, well, this is a, we, we have to learn lessons from this point of history, what, they, what, what they're saying, and, and I'm, I don't say that's wrong, but when people say that, they mean this historical event uh, is so important that we have to uh, make it relevant and uh, for our policy today. And I think that there's a great deal of misunderstanding about World War II, because, and it's held up over and over and over, especially yes. here in the United States, by political leaders. You know, the Soviet Union, before it collapsed, um, over and over told its citizens, whatever other problems it had, the Soviet Union was a great thing because they had defeated fascism. That was one of the great things that the Soviet Union says was their, was their stellar achievement. For the Soviet Union, World War II was very important because the Soviet Union emerged from World War II as probably, well, uh, along with the United States, the great victorious power. And that's also true of the United States of America as well. And so for both countries, now Soviet Union, of course, is gone. But for the United States, World War II is held up as the great triumph of America over evil. And the, the, the real truth of the matter is that that's a simplistic and even dangerously simplistic view, I think, of World War II. Yeah. And so I would say there's two major historical uh, issues that I think are especially relevant, important, and, de- and important to deal with objectively. That is the Middle East conflict the narrative and World War II. And we put a great deal of emphasis over the years on those two great um, historical questions. Absolutely. The Middle East and uh, the Second World War. These topics are connected, of course, as, as all things are in history. Nothing is disconnected. You have a succession of events happening. Right. The, the Second World War ending in 1945, and then we have the uh, Israel created in 1948. And, and uh, we have, as you say, Mark, the, the EU, the, EA, uh, the UN, the League of Nations, and all these things coming into fruition after right. the Second World War to try to prevent this from ever happening again. But to understand World War II, we also need to go back to, to World War I. Uh, so maybe we can begin there right. and and see what you how you you would like to present some of this uh, material from your perspective, Mark. Well, that's right. I mean, World War II is is in a sense almost well in many ways became inevitable uh, out of out of the chaos of the First World War. I I don't. I mean, I did a broadcast just recently about this, and I was citing over and over the um, the the writing of of George Kennan. He's a great American historian and diplomat, and he emphasized how world, the First World War was really the seminal conflict, the great uh, Ur catastrophe, as it, it might say in German, that that, that shattered the the uh, um, stability of of the Western world. It was a a, 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 a conflict that ended up in the um, destruction of the Romanov dynasty in Russia, the end of the Russian Empire, the end of the Hohenzollern dynasty in Germany, and and, uh, breaking up, of course, of Germany, the breaking up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the shattering of of an old world order. And out of that chaos, of course, came uh, the rise of of, of the uh, communist state in Russia, the Bolshevik um, regime in Russia, uh, the chaos that uh, brought uh, from that the rise of uh, Mussolini and Hitler and so forth in, in Middle Europe and Central Europe. And then out of that, uh, the unresolved issues of the First World War and the tremendous um, 
disappointment about the uh, promises of the Allies led almost inevitably to the to the conflict we call the Second World War. But um, that's right, the uh, 20th century and uh, Second World War, none of those events are in a vacuum. They're very closely related to each other. And by the same token, how we look at uh, the Middle East and the founding of the State of Israel is also very closely related yeah. to the aftermath of the Second World War. One of the most important points I, we try to make over and over is history isn't really written by the winners. History is written by those who have, have power. There may be a change of narrative about World War II. For example, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, end of, of Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, there was an enormous rewriting of history throughout Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Suddenly, textbooks that have been in place for many, many years were out of date. And Eastern Europe today, and to a lesser extent, or, to, or maybe to a greater extent, so Russia, are still trying to grapple with their historical narrative mm. because our historical narrative is a great deal it, it's really in a sense our sense of ourselves our our identity or collective identity of every society is closely tied up to its sort of national narrative of itself how it views itself and eastern europe is still going through that now um and in all of this, there's, uh, well, well, uh, who, who, how, how history is presented in every society isn't just who wins the war, because eventually time goes on. It's who holds power in society at the moment. Yeah. That's going to be a decisive factor in how we look at the past and ultimately how we're expected to look at ourselves as a, as a, as a people. I mean, yeah. you know, each country being different. Absolutely. If we, um, if we look a little bit at the the what seems to be the catalyst for World War One. We have an interesting piece of, of of information there that I'd like to you know run by and see what your take on that is. The Black Hand, uh, Gavrilo Princip, right? He he murdered the uh, Emperor Franz Joseph, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, chief uh, at the time, right? What? what uh, how do you see this? The Black Hand is a, a kind of a secret society almost behind this event that just kicks off World War One. Is it that simple? No, it's not that simple. No, I mean, uh, very often in history, and I and I know that you know many people have a have a different view, but very often in history, um, events uh, take place that are catastrophic, not because this is the intention, but the, out of stupidity, out of a miscalculation. Very often in history, uh, the the people who have power are not don't make decisions aren't necessarily evil or wrong decisions; they're miscalculations. Mm -hmm. The greatest conflict in American history is the American Civil War. Now, no one at the beginning of the American Civil War wanted or anticipated a conflict anything like the catastrophe that eventually took place from 1861 to 1865 in the United States. It was the it, more Americans died in that conflict than in World War One, World War Two, Korean War combined. I mean, enormously terrible thing. But at the beginning, no one really saw that. But underlying the Differences between the North and the South were fundamentally different views, and each side uh, jockeyed for power, position, and so forth, and it led to this tremendous thing. Now, it wasn't because somebody said at the very beginning, oh, we're going to have this terrible conflict, lots of people are going to die. Right. Right. A similar thing happened in World War I. At the very beginning of the conflict, uh, in England, in Germany, in France, in Russia, people tremendously miscalculated. The uh, contrary to what Allies said after World War One, the German Emperor Kaiser uh, Wilhelm he didn't want a huge war. He was trying to support Austria. Uh, Austria had this tremendous problem with Serbia because of the weakness of its own uh, internal multicultural problems, and uh, Russia mobilized because they were defending Serbia. But no one expected the conflict to drag on for four years and to destroy, wipe out so much of the uh, uh, best of the young people all over Europe. A terrible, terrible ca catastrophe, culturally, genetically, every, in every possible way. But again, it wasn't something that anybody uh, at, at that time foresaw the, the, the scope of that catastrophe. Similarly, in World War II, well, I mean, uh, when, when Germany attacked Poland, Hitler was actually surprised and shocked and amazed that Britain and France would go to war to defend Poland. Mm -hmm. And nobody foresaw that shortly after that, then Russia attacked from the east and took Poland. And nobody foresaw how quickly Germany was able to subdue France in, 19, in, in the summer of 1940. And the war 
turned out very, very differently than any of the major powers expected that it, that it would. And very often in history, that's the situation. And that's why, in our time, it's very, very important, especially for leaders, to base their policies and their decisions on a realistic sense of what's going on and not in terms of what they want to happen. Very, very often, terrible things happen, not because people intend bad things, but they may even, intentions may be good, but if it's not realistic, if it's not based on reality, the consequences will be catastrophic. Over and over in history, we've seen people who seem to be well-meaning, uh, their intentions seem to be good, maybe they're sincere. It's very hard to know people's real motives. Yeah. But if they're not based on reality, the results are going to be catastrophic. And right now in America, I am extremely worried that the political leaders of our country, both Democratic and, and Republican, base policies on notions about how the world ought to be, not the way the world really is. Hmm. And the results are inevitably going to be cat catastrophic and bad. Yeah. I want to go back to a point you mentioned, Mark, the, the murder of uh, young men, as, as you mentioned. Who, who and, and, and why did this happen? Is the evidence of this in the outcome, or is the agenda more documented than this? In, in, in 1914, with the assassination of Franz, uh, the Archduke uh, Ferdinand, you mean? Well, is that what you're talking about? Well, it, it, you talked about also the, 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 the outcome of, of, of these wars. We have a, a murder of a lot of young men from all uh, over right. the European continent yeah. and later America as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, but I, I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no, <laughs> I, I you, you brought it up that, that one of the consequences of what happened here was uh, the right. you, you know the eradication of a lot of uh, young men who were battling right. and, and forcing right. uh, and I guess we just want to right. clarify do you think that this was an an, an agenda or this or was this just an unfortunate outcome of the event itself I think it was a, a tragic and terrible outcome I don't think it was foreseen by by any of the people that that it would be that terrible okay and yeah. no I, and I don't think also in in the in the American Civil War anybody foresaw in fact if people had foreseen, I think, um, certainly in World War I, there would have been uh, far more strenuous efforts to try to avoid the conflict. But very, very often that's, that happens in history. Um, the Vietnam War. I mean, Lyndon Johnson, I think we know pretty well now what Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson's motives were, uh, what, why he did what he did. He based it on false uh, understanding of the conflict in Vietnam and of the realities there and kept on sending more and more troops, the result was a, was a, was a catastrophe that led to the, the, the death of 50,000 Americans and, of course, almost incalculable numbers of, of Vietnam, the Vietnamese. I mean, terrible, terrible thing. But it wasn't because Lyndon Johnson was an evil man, but he, 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 he didn't understand the situation. He, he uh, ignored the advice of people who knew much more about the thing. He carried on ba on the basis of a worldview and a, a set of, uh, of ideas about history directly related to his understanding about World War II, by the way, that were wrong, just complete, simply wrong, and the result was a catastrophe and th th that he did not, and I don't think nobody really wanted or foresaw. Well, and, and this is a really interesting point, and this is what, what I want to try to get a little closer to. If there was well-meaning politicians at the time, uh, but again, you, you bring up the advisors, because that's a key element here. Do you believe that someone actually is pulling the strings, in the, if we can call it that way, uh, behind the scenes, having an agenda, uh, because if we have well-meaning people, how can it go so wrong so much of the time, Mark? Well, it, it, I think that the manipulation that takes place is not a direct one in terms of strings being pulled. It's, it's more subtle uh, th than that. You know, very often in life, uh, we ourselves as individuals have a hard time fully understanding until later our own motives, why we do things. Why do we go with this person in love and not another person? Why do we take this job and not another one? Oftentimes our motives, even at the time, are not completely, completely clear. And that's why it's also very difficult to second guess or to try to understand the, the motives of others. They're, they're, but they're often based on understanding and assumptions that we are barely conscious of ourselves. Now, I know that's, that sounds rather vague, but look, let me go back to say the, the the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson and the American leaders over and over and over kept on drawing so-called lessons from World War II that were wrong, false. Now, this isn't because they were manipulated in a, in a, in a direct way. They were manipulated in a more indirect way. 
they um, were told, well, if we don't stop the communists, quote unquote, now, they're going to take over us all Southeast Asia and they're going to do this. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's not what happened in the 1930s. And so they're... Uh, uh, the lessons they drew for it uh, and, and, the co- and the policies they carried out as a result of it were, were wrong. Now, a more important uh, 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 and more directly related one is now the comparisons with Iran and uh, the Middle East uh, situation today, where, where, where there, there is a, um, an assumption in the American media that because of the lessons, quote-unquote, of World War II, America and the world must support Israel in whatever it does, basically. That's hmm. what American politicians say. Yeah. That's, not, that's, that's ridiculous, really. That's, that's dangerous to do that. And to tie the fate of and the welfare of America and much of the world in the, to, to the policies of a country just because uh, its people suffered in World War II, it doesn't mean that the American leaders are manipulated in a direct way, but they've absorbed a tremendous amount of propaganda that, uh, well, you see, Israel is founded by people who suffered, so we have this obligation to support them. They're democratic. It's more indirect than that. There is a tremendous amount of of, of propaganda over and over, uh, especially here in the United States, that tells us, in effect, we have to support Israel no matter what. Now, that's a that's a manipulation, but it's not a, a direct manipulation. It's a manipulation of our minds, of our outlook, yeah. and that's a more subtle one. It's it's formed by motion pictures, by tele by television, by newspaper articles that are supposed to create sympathies and so forth. And what politicians do over and over is justify uh, actions. Uh, 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 they, they find pretexts for what they do, and they, they, they adjust their own consciences to, to fit what, they're, what, they, what they want to do based on images and so forth that are, are as much emotional as they, as they are really realistic. Absolutely, that's a really so, important uh, no, point. To, to, get, to, get back to, to get back to your point, the, the manipula- manipula- it, uh, let, let's, let's, let's be more specific. Let, uh, let's even go, go more directly mm-hmm. about uh, the role that you might say the Jewish lobby or so forth takes place in the United States of America today. The, the agenda of what, what can be called the Jewish lobby, the Israel lobby, organized Jewish community, it's not secretive, it's fairly open. Sure. It, it, what what, what, what uh, Jewish leaders or Israeli leaders want isn't all that secret. It's pretty, pretty obvious. It's laid out in, in a pretty open way. And it doesn't require manipulation in a highly secretive, uh, narrow way. It's, it's manipulation in a, in, a, in a much more broad way, accompanied with tremendous amounts of propaganda, uh, tremendous amounts of, of media manipulation and so forth, that's not as not direct, not, not, not a uh, direct and narrow one in the sense that many people who talk about conspiracies mean, but in a, in a, in a, more, um, in a more general way. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't conspiracies, sure. that there aren't efforts secretly that are carried out. But the, the, these kinds of conspiracies, I think, are not possible in society without uh, – they're not, it's not possible to carry out, I think, a really complicated conspiracy and keep it secret very successful for a long time. We tend to know after a period of time what really happened. In fact, one of the interesting things about the history of the 20th century is that the lag time between – uh, events taking place and then finding out what was the story behind them gets shorter and shorter. In other words, um, uh, it, it took some time to learn about some of the background and so forth about World War I or the secrets about that. Documents became uh, public um, that were secret uh, later on during the course of the war and after the war. But nowadays, especially with the Internet and the modern communications, all sorts of secret uh, uh, agreements and so forth, they come out fairly quickly. And yeah. one of the best examples of that is uh, Julian Assange's ability to make public all sorts of secret documents <laughs> that in the past would never have been made secret. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, one of the great problems of our society is not that information isn't available, it's that people just don't care or draw any consequences from yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, okay. and it's almost wanna, too much wanna, as well. Go ahead, Mark. There's almost too much. Look, for example, there was a there was a time when if um, uh, Americans were told or if people had known that uh, the U.S. government was carrying out 
assassinations and torture of people, Americans would have been outraged about that. Now it's, it's well known, it's well documented, there's no real secret about it, but the fact is people just simply don't care. They don't, they, it's, 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 that's to me as, as astonishing as anything. Yeah. You know, right now, the United States leaders, including Obama and the Republicans, are all talking about uh, uh, a threat of war against Iran. They say, the words they use is, uh, all options are on the table. Well, that's a polite way of saying, we may even uh, uh, attack your country with nuclear weapons. When they say all options are on the table, now, how many Americans know, how many people understand that even the threat like that is illegal under the UN Charter? It's illegal to threaten another country with war if they don't change their policy is itself a crime by the United Nations Charter that the United States is a signatory toward. Yeah, to, well, uh, they, they don't care about Americans the, the, don't care. the rules. No. People, people, simply, people simply don't care. The Amer especially here in this country, uh, Americans' leaders carry out policies that if any other country carried them out, we would, we would express outrage about it. In fact, uh, and again, I'm jumping a little bit, and after World War II, German leaders were put to death for policies and actions that American leaders are now carrying out. Hmm. This is an astonishing thing. Yeah. And the, the, the big problem isn't as much knowledge about uh, that this happened or that happened. Even things that we know are true, there's no reaction. There's no, there's no consequence of it. And this is even more dangerous. And maybe it's all the worse, as a number of historians have pointed out, in a democratic society, because in a democratic society, in order to get the public behind policy, the, it's, it's almost necessary, it's, it's almost obligatory to present issues in a simplistic, emotional way to get the vast majority of people behind it. To get people to support um, a, a policy of war, it's almost, in a democratic society, the leaders have to portray the enemy as evil, as threatening everybody. He has to be destroyed. And that makes it very difficult to adjust policy in any, in any uh, calibrated, any, 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 any prudent way. I mean, so over and over, American leaders will say, this leader or that leader, he's like a new Hitler. He's good, terrible. He's evil. He's going to take over the world. And that's crazy. It's stupid. But the mass majority of the public will not... Um, support a policy of war or you know or, or strong policies unless the leaders are able to portray the enemy in the most diabolical, terrible ways, and that's a pro problem of, of democracy and uh, the mass media in a modern democratic society. I'm afraid. Oh yeah, you bet. There's so many important points in there of what you've raised and brought up. I mean, first of all, they don't follow the rules that they've created in the beginning. It, it's it's not for them, it's for everybody else they create the rules, it seems like, which is just <laughs> astonishing yes. and amazing yes. in well, itself. In, fa in, in fact, one of the most, I think, uh, really disturbing things is how many American political leaders now talk over and over about America as a so-called exceptional country. What, they, what that means, and they talk about Israel, too, as being exceptional. What that, what that means in practical terms is that America is not, we don't hold ourselves to the standards in international affairs that we insist upon of other people. We say, in effect, we get to do things that if other countries do it, we're going to attack them or yeah. uh, uh, condemn them or whatever. And this, this is a form of arrogance, very, very dangerous. This, this, this arrogant view that uh, we're better, we're a better people, uh, we're morally superior, ethically superior, so we get to do things and we'll carry out, we, we're, don't hold us to the same standards that we hold others, that is extremely dangerous. That's a, that, and we see that manifest more and more in American policy. Many American leaders, and of course the vast majority of the American people, don't understand just why so many millions of people around the world are furious at what the United States is doing. Because Americans think our motives are good, so what we do is really for everybody's good, so why are they complaining? What's the problem right, here? Right, right. See, that's, and this is what happens when it's so black and white, the issue, that we are, we are on the side, we are on the right side, so, so it's okay. Right. We can do whatever we want because right. we're doing it for the, for the purpose of the good of all, in a way. And, and this doesn't apply. It doesn't right. work like this. Right, and, and, and I've, I did a broadcast about this some, some months ago. I, I stressed that in 
our individual lives and also in uh, world uh, terms, people should try to follow what I call the golden rule. You treat other people in other countries the way you would want to be treated. Yes, very but simple. That's why leaders, leaders who insist that, no, we're exceptional, that is exactly the opposite of that. That's a dangerous, dangerous thing, and the consequences of that are going to be very bad. Now, America, fortunately for America, has been able to get away with a lot of this because we are separated from the rest of the world by big oceans. Uh, America doesn't have the same dependency on the rest of the world that many other countries do. As you know, the European countries are all close next, next to each other. Uh, they can't... Uh, they can't get away with uh, talking in this in this exaggerated way about the how exceptional they are in the way the United States can, because this is a very large country with great resources, separated from the rest of the world by by great oceans. So America could get away with that, as it were, in a way that other countries um, cannot and and do not. Is America, in your opinion, being used? I mean, I've heard this from other people used as the the world police, the enforcer of, of, of these wars that we see now spanning across the globe yeah. uh, for somebody else. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's it, you know, I, I would say this. Yes, it's done for American uh, economic you know, business interests and so forth, but there's something more uh, disturbing happening, I think. There's a motive below that that's even more disturbing, that America's insistence on having military bases around the world and of carrying out a policy uh, based on the idea that we're better, this is a, an essential a part, I think, of the American identity. Because the United States is not like most countries in that it has a, a pretty established culture, cultural and or ethnic or religious identity. America's identity is tied up to its ideology. The, uh, the, it, the America's identity as a country that's good, that what we do is good around the world and internally, is a big factor in uh, America's uh, justification of being a world policeman. If, you're, uh, if, if your identity, if, if, a, if the identity of a country is that we have a responsibility to do good around the world, then uh, and it's based upon a notion of, of oneself as being exceptionally good, then almost inevitably we have to be a world policeman. If we know better than others, if America really is as good and as ethical and as uh, a great bastion of freedom and uh, equality around the world the way we say we are, then we have an obligation to to enforce that view all over the world. If we don't, then America doesn't have much to fall back on. That's a that's a different that's a, that's a dangerous thing. In other words, in other words, America's foreign policy is is a is an expression not merely of uh, business interests or of the interests of people who have power in America. It's also an expression of of a of a worldview that's a, an essential part of America's identity. The question of democracy and all of this, uh, the alleged rule of the people. Uh, we had Gilad Atzman with us a while back. He mentioned the difference, for example, uh, between then a country like uh, the United States or Israel too, for that matter, uh, and compared to that of Germany before World War II. Um, before this broke out, the, we actually had a situation where the German Reichstag was, was dissolved back in 1933, which obviously doesn't uh, leave the people completely off the hook, but there's a major uh, difference there. Have you heard about this, Mark? And, and if so, what's your comment on, on this? I, I don't know what you what you're exactly referring to. I, I would put. I, I think if I get the drift of what you're saying, I would put it this way. You know, um, to what extent does a people does a do the population of a country have responsibility for the actions of its leaders? Right. Germany has been over, for many many years trying to atone, as it were, through restitution and payment for the policies of the Third Reich government. It pays billions and billions over the years in restitution or reparations to Israel and, and Jewry, because Germans in a, are saying we have a responsibility as a people uh, for what the Third Reich government did. Now, is that really true? I mean, if it, if, it, if it was true then, how much more true is it of the United States today, or should be true, because America claims that its policies 
uh, are sanctioned and approved by the American people. It doesn't claim that it, uh, its, its leaders are doing this because they have a greater knowledge. It's America, supposedly, as a democracy, is supposed to be... But the, but the fact is, the truth is, Americans take almost no sense of responsibility for, for what we do. And Germany, oddly enough, even though they say, well, Hitler was a dictator, he did whatever he wanted, it's a remarkable thing that Germany should take any responsibility because they could say, well, we didn't approve of it, uh, we didn't, we, uh, it was a dictatorship and we don't have any responsibility, but they don't. Germans say we have a collective responsibility. That's a very important fundamental question. To what extent does any people, any country, have a responsibility for the actions of its government. Uh, and I, and I, but I don't, I don't know what Gilad Otsman had to say specifically. By the way, a man whose courage I greatly admire. I mean, mm, I'm, yeah. I'm just astonished at how uh, courageous he is to say things that anyone who's not Jewish uh, feels intimidated to say. He's, he allow, he's able to say things um, in our society or get away with it as, as, as it were, uh, because he, he's, he's Jewish. And that's a dangerous thing too, because, uh, there, there's a, a tremendous double standard in that. Uh, we, we permit someone who's Jewish to talk about Jewish matters, uh, with more frankness and openness than we would anybody else. And, but the, 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 the essential standard should not be whose background, uh, what the background of somebody is. It should be whether what he says is true or not. Exactly. Uh, yes. Gunter Grass, Gunter Grass, as you know, a few weeks ago issued this poem critical of Israel. And many of those who were critical of what he had to say focused not on what he said, but on his background, because he was German, and for a few months at the very end of the war, he was in the SS. That should be irrelevant, really. It doesn't guilt, matter. Guilt by association. Uh, that, that, this is a fallacy. I mean, w yeah, we can't fall right. in these traps. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Right, right, exactly true, right. That's a, it's, it's guilt by association or so forth. And just as the fact that he had been in the SS at the end of the war uh, does not make what he says ir irrelevant, by the same token, because a leader who is Jewish says something, we shouldn't give him more credibility or more credence just because he happens to be Jewish. But that's very much what happens sometimes in our in our society. Absolutely. It's the problem of being immediately branded an, an anti-Semite just for criticizing Israel or some of the actions of of a country or, or so forth. And also the double double standard you mentioned is very important. For instance, yeah. Mark, a while back here, we, we linked up a story about a, uh, an Israeli celebrity, I guess she is, a talk show celebrity. Um, Irit Liner is, is her name. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Anyway, she explained how, how she was glad to see uh, the Israeli Defense Force, an officer there, uh, slam the butt of his rifle into the face of an unarmed, nonviolent Danish peace uh, activist, right. just because of the right. fact that he had golden hair and made him look like a member of the Hitler Jugend, you know. So, <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. this is this is incredible. What what a statement! And the fact that I mean, I haven't heard any major outlashings against this. Have you? Right. Well, the the video has gone all over the world. Of course, uh, we put up uh, we we highlighted it on our on our uh, media uh, on our uh, website as as well. But that that's just one example of many that of. Of actions that, uh, if carried out by other countries, would have been condemned and would have been noted in, in by American leaders and by other leaders. But that's a good example. That that what you're t what you're talking about there, that particular incident, is a good example, I think, of things that are happening all over the world that millions of people see and are and know about, but it's not uh, acknowledged by our political leaders or by the mainstream media. That's a one manifestation of a big crisis, I think, that's happening throughout the Western world. A, a greater and greater chasm or disparity mm -hmm. between what people sort of know and what the official view is, you might say. You know, propaganda of any society is, is, is powerful, but it's not all powerful. In the old Soviet Union, the Communist Party controlled the media, obviously. But what happens when uh, 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 the leaders of a country and the media uh, say things that are untrue is eventual, and, and when people see that it, it, it's different than their experiences, they tend not to believe in increasingly whatever the leaders say. Right. Something like that is happening now in, in Europe and the United States. People increasingly 
are skeptical and dubious about whatever now they hear in the media. They don't know quite what to believe. There's a, and that's a dangerous thing for any society, a breakdown of, of trust, uh, of a kind of fundamental trust and confidence in the uh, credibility and the leadership, uh, both politically and uh, culturally, uh, of society. That, we're seeing that all over the Western world today. That's a very, very, a very dangerous thing. And at the same time, I can't help to think, Mark, that in in some way it's also good because the appeal to authority has lost its power, meaning the people, yes. first of all, think for themselves instead of believing the, the professor with the degree, right. if you know what I mean. That's right. That's right. I, I, I understand that completely, and I and I support that. But uh, nonetheless, it's in a healthy society, people should have a high level of confidence and uh, trust in their in their leaders but of course i want people to be skeptical we we encourage people to uh, think for themselves about what we're told officially over and over i i agree but that's 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 right in a in a good healthy society uh, people uh, should have a level of trust but that trust of course has to be earned it has to be based on on reality but in the time we live in today uh, the great Uh, need of our time is to be skeptical, I think, because mm. we are being deceived and lied to by our leaders politically and and, and so forth. Absolutely, and in many cases this uh, deception comes in the form of, of omission or, or simply just not talking yes. about certain things when yes. we look back into history. Yes. For instance, two things that are really put things into context for me, Mark, about the, uh, well, first of all, the Treaty of Versailles. And then later, yep. the, the Balfour Declaration. Can, can you talk a little bit about these and how you think that these are, are important? Yes, they're they're very important. Well, um, first of all, the, the Balfour Declaration, of course, was a was a, um, a statement by the British government in 1917 to support a quote Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, the, that 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 wording is, is was deliberately vague. Whether that means a state, whether it means in Palestine or all of Palestine. But it was a pledge by the British government to um, uh, Jewish leaders to enlist their support for, especially in the United States, for Jewish involvement in the First World War. Because at the time, up until 1917, Jewish public opinion uh, in, in Europe and in the United States tended to be supportive of the central powers, of Germany, because the big – because – the uh, country that Jews tended to hate the most at the time was Tsarist Russia, and that was on the Allied side. So after the overthrow of the Tsar, and to secure uh, support from, from Jews for the, uh, for the um, Allied cause in the First World War, Lord Balfour issued this declaration promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, the interesting, one of the interesting things about this is that this pledge was deceitful because it was contrary to other pledges the Allies were giving to the Arabs that they would have uh, self-determination after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, which was, of course, an ally of Germany, and contrary to still more pledges that were made secretly between Britain and France to carve up the Middle East between their co those two countries. Yeah. Now, this, this, uh, the Balfour Declaration was a deliberate... Um, calculation by the British government to gain Jewish support in the First World War, but it was deceitful and deliberately vague because it was uh, making promises that were contrary to other promises the British uh, were making, as I said, both to the Arabs and to uh, the French about the future of the Middle East. And it wasn't until uh, the uh, Bolsheviks took power in Russia that they began publishing Uh, making public secret treaties that the British and the French and had been making. Now, that deceit also uh, was true of the Treaty of Versailles as well. The Americans and British and the French during the First World War pledged over and over that uh, what they wanted was a world in which there would be no victors or vanquished. They didn't want to crush Germany. They didn't want to uh, destroy Germany. They merely wanted a new world afterwards in which there would be no war and there would be justice for everybody. Well, on the basis of those promises made by pres especially President Wilson in his so-called 14 points, which was endorsed by the British and French, which were endorsed by the British and the French, 
the Germans uh, agreed to an armistice in 1918. But very shortly afterwards, the British, the French, and most notably the Americans broke those pledges and instead imposed a harsh and punitive Treaty of Versailles on Germany that was both ethically uh, contemptible and also was very harsh and completely contrary to the pledges the Allies had made. This led to tremendous disillusionment in Germany in the promises of democratic leaders, in the promises and the credibility of, of the United States, and uh, helped to discredit, of course, the government that came to power after World War I in Germany, the so-called Weimar Republic, yes. and made it very weak. And so Hitler was able to say truthfully during the 20s, well, how much real sincerity is there by the Americans and the British about democracy when they have shafted and stabbed in the, and, and uh, shafted the, the Germans contrary to their own pledges? Their, not, their word isn't worth anything. The Treaty of Versailles was a tremendous betrayal of promises that the British, French, and especially the Americans had made during the war. And it, it, this kind of um, betrayal of trust is, has consequences far beyond what, what people realize. If I can jump to the present, uh, right now, uh, well, you might remember that after Barack Obama was elected president, he made a very highly publicized visit to the Middle East and spoke at the University of Cairo in 2009. Do, do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Okay. In that speech, which was, again, very carefully crafted, he said that the uh, oppression of the Palestinians, and this is his words, is intolerable, he said. And this uh, led to a tremendous feeling among many people around the world that he was going to do something about that. In fact, the hopes about Barack Obama were so high that he was given what arguably is the world's most prestigious honor, the Not Nobel anymore. Peace Prize. Not anymore. They have discredited not anymore. themselves no, but, so much. No, but my point <laughs> is he was, he was given that not for anything he had done, exactly. but for what people hoped and expected yeah, he would do. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That's a very interesting parallel yeah. with Woodrow Wilson in World War I. People had tremendous hope at the end of World War I that Woodrow Wilson was going to be this great man of peace. He was going to usher in this new world. Now, here we are now, 2012, and Barack Obama has broken that promise and that pledge. The oppression or the occupation of Palestinians seems to be quite tolerable to Barack Obama. Yeah. And around the world, there is tremendous disillusionment by a man who makes these promises, these pledges, that are just words. They're just they're, they're, they're empty, empty promises and empty pledges. They're two-faced. They, they, they talk to please the audience wherever they may end up to, to get them on their side. I mean, this is propaganda as, as, yes. as ever. Yeah. Yes, yes. This is propaganda. Now, again, we don't know what's in, I mean, we don't know for sure what's in Barack Obama's mind. But I, I think probably his mind or his heart uh, wants to do some things that he feels he can't do. But this is a this is typical of many American leaders. There's lots of high rhetoric and lots of, of noble sounding words that when it comes down to the nut of the thing, when it comes right down to it, they don't they're not really serious about. You know, back in nineteen thirty eight, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain wrote he said it is always safest and best, he wrote, to count on nothing from the Americans except words. Now, many, many times, that's a harsh thing to say, but that's been shown, I think, over and over again, that in the case of the Treaty of Versailles, in the case of Barack Obama, and of course many other presidents, there's a lot of words and rhetoric that often sound good, but that you can't count on them. Mm. They're, they're not serious. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, it's a very interesting and important discussion here we're having about about history, about uh, you know many of the problems in the world, tying it into... What is going on today as well, Mark? Uh, I think we should take a, a short little pause at this point to continue in the next segment. We have just so much more to talk about. I want to, I mean, I, I have so many notes here. We, we uh, are not going to be able to get to it all here today, but we'll do what we can and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try as best as we can here. Why don't we end this hour, Mark, talking a little bit more about the website, 
uh, about what you guys uh, offer and if there's any other kind of material that you want to mention for audiences here who are, who are interested in, in learning and knowing more about what you do. Well, I want to encourage listeners to check out the IHR website. There's a tremendous amount of information, not merely on the homepage of the website, but a tremendous archive of articles um, about a whole number of historical questions that, I, that has a kind of consistency and I think a credibility that's, that's, that's sorely lacking in, in many other websites. A, a, a seriousness and an influence that I think is um, very, very unique, very rare. We have, I'm very pleased about how much influence many of the articles and the broadcasts and so forth that we put out have around the world as shown, for example, by how high we're rated on Google searches on different, on, on a number of topics. But you'll find, we, we try, we strive very hard to present material with uh, as much uh, credibility and solidity as, as possible on a, on a wide range of issues. And um, I think anybody who checks out the website will uh, be you know, pleasantly surprised at, at what they'll find. Um, and again, what we try to do is not merely talk about history in a, in a dry or simply academic way, but to tie this to issues of really great world global importance in our, in our, in our day. Absolutely. It's IHR.org, the Institute for Historical Review IHR.org. It's one of those days, uh, Mark, when I stumble on the words. But uh, in any regard, we'll have the. We'll no, have it the, happens, happens to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have it up on yeah. the website, the right URL right there. Uh, very important addition to, to many of the websites that people, I think, uh, go to to check the news and so forth. So do uh, take, uh, take a look and, and go through some of the material there. Okay, Mark, let's take a short little break at this point. We'll continue with more uh, when we return after this. Usually, only a minority questions thinks deeper and second guesses history. And when they do, they usually face criticism for doing so, unfortunately. The word review or revision simply means to look again. And uh, that has been associated with something that you're not supposed to do. And uh, that is a shame. In the second segment, Mark discusses Germany's predicament, events before and after World War II, propagated lies about Hitler and his policies. Also, we cover parallels between Nazi Germany and the European Union. Mark explains why a realistic view of World War II is crucial for our current time. We'll discuss American policy, identity and world crusades. We end the program discussing the Israeli lobby, Jewish power in America and America's undying support for Israel. A very important continuation of our interview with Mark Weber is next. To listen to this or any of our previous programs in their entirety, subscribe to our member section and get full access to the website. Also, we spare you from commercial breaks and the website is free from blinking banners. We have over 500 programs or uh, probably more now in our members area on all kinds of different topics. Go to redicecreations.com. All the information is right there for you. Also, we have some excellent programs coming your way next on Red Ice Radio. If you stay with us, you'll be able to hear Mary Sean Young, the actress from Blade Runner and Dune, coming on the program talking about her own awakening and how she got into many of the topics that we address on this program. After this, we have Court Lindahl, Holland van den Nuenhoff, Tom Horn, Cliff High, Dean Clifford, Jordan Maxwell, Peter Halderson, Neil Kramer, Richard Merrick, Nora Getgaudas, Alex Newman, Eric Karlström, Britt D. and Tom Secker, to name a few. Our second hour with Mark Weber is next, so stay with us.